Hi everyone, welcome to Drinks with Kate. I managed to have my phone put away already by five o'clock today. Um, the lighting is so interesting in this room. I keep changing spots because I can't work it out, but it's supposed to be here on the Mornington Peninsula raining and overcast. And right now, as you can see, the sun is streaming in the window. I'm beautifully side lit. Um, so anyway, I thought, We'll just try try this way. It's a little bit dark behind me. It's a little bit bright on the side, but this is the beauty of live television. Uh, welcome to Tasting with Kate. Now, I wanted to, before I forgot and before I got into the tasting, I had a few, and my phone's buzzing at me already. Um, <laughs> James Hine, you're a very bad man. Uh, I just wanted to let you guys know if you're as technologically inept as I am, which is which is pretty inept um, I, I, I would not have a clue how to log into this but I have been given advice and so if you're having trouble logging into the actual live chat you can um, sign in with your Gmail account is the easiest way to do it if it's still not working um, or if you don't have a Gmail account or you don't know what a Gmail account is don't worry just open a glass open a bottle of wine pour a glass sit back relax enjoy the chat without even feeling like you have to engage it's wonderful um, so today we're going to be tasting some Pinot Gris. Again, you'll say, oh, we did Pinot Gris last week. How boring. But it's not boring. It's really exciting because this is a completely different Pinot Gris. This is, as you've seen from the pictures, my beautiful Pinot Gris on skins. Ooh, look at that. 2018. Gorgeous colour. It's particularly lovely when the sun shines through it. Now, how on earth, do I hear you ask, how on earth do we get this sort of colour in Pinot Gris? And I had, I actually had a friend who's a master of wine ask me, um, from South Africa, ask me about uh, Pinot Gris that are this, this sort of colour. And she said, surely they must put a bit of Pinot Noir or something in there to colour it up. But this is actually 100% Pinot Gris. The difference is that the Pinot Gris that we tasted last week, we picked it and we pressed the juice off the skin straight away and fermented the juice on its own. And that's the traditional way to make a white wine. With this wine, we pick the fruit, we put the fruit through a destemmer, which takes the stalks out and puts the berries into the fermenter. And then we ferment it on the skins, like we do all of our red wines. So this is not a traditional rosé. This is a very, very pale red wine. So one of the rules, it's not, there are no rules. There are no rules with wine. That's one of the great things about wine. But one of, the, one of my self-imposed rules about this wine is that I think this wine, because it's pink and because it comes in a clear bottle, a lot of people look at it and think, ah, it's a rosé. I've got to put it in the fridge and serve it really cold. And that would be um, a pretty normal thing to do with a pretty normal rosé. It would be... Not a great thing to do on a day like today. I don't know what the weather's like where you are, but it's 13 degrees centigrade here at Muraduka State. As I said, there's a bit of sunshine, which is lovely, but it's starting to look pretty stormy out there again. So it's not really a freezing cold rosé on a hot day kind of a wine. This is actually works really well as a red wine. Serve it at room temperature. So if you've had it in the fridge, don't stress, it hasn't wrecked it. You might just want to let it warm up a little bit in the glass. So let's get it into the glass. While I'm pouring, I'm also going to say hi to a couple of folk who I've seen recently and who I haven't seen for a long time. So people who are watching from nearby, um, I was just talking to my sister, Beck, who drank her, wrote her uh, Pinot Gris on Skins last week. Sorry, Beck, I failed to drop another bottle in for you for this tasting. But Angela Nicholas also wanted to say hi and thank you for the bread, which is all gone now. Uh, I also wanted to say hello to someone a long way away, and that's Jeff's daughter, Maddie. Hi, Maddie. I hear you're watching in from England. Um, I hear you've been a bit under the weather, so I hope you're feeling better now. And, uh, and I hope that, well, if you haven't got a glass of Pinot Gris on skins, I hope that it's about 9 o'clock in the morning, I think, UK time. So maybe don't crack a bottle right now, but, um, but I hope you have a nice glass of something really soon. I don't know if you can see in the background, but Reggie is just outside. He's just, if you look down in the corner, you can just see him. I'll just adjust the camera. He's just down in the corner. He's bobbing up and down. He's probably more interesting than me at the moment. He's waiting for his dinner. So probably if we're lucky, 
we'll have um, Jill and Richard walking through with food for the peacock uh, and collecting the cats and bringing the barking dogs through as well. So it's all very exciting. Um, I have just got a message from someone. I hope that uh, I hope people can see me. I've got someone who's logged in. Penny's logged in, but she can't see me. She can't find me. Um, I can't see a live chat either. So I think we might be having trouble with our live chat again today. Um, so if you do want to text me, if you're watching and you want to text me, my phone number is 0413 349 934. And you're very welcome to send me a little, a little text. Ah, hello, I have got a message. Thank you. Thank you, the K Pharaoh. Lovely to see you. <laughs> um, so there are some, and Jeff's there as well. Good. Ah, uh, Jackie, hi. Oh, good. Oh, hi, everyone. Lovely to see you. Thank you. It always it worries me sometimes that I'm talking to, a, to an empty box and there's no one there. So thank you for, for uh, reassuring me. So Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris on skins. It's a beautiful pink colour. And people, a lot of people ask me, why on earth would you make Pinot Gris like this? Because Pinot Gris traditionally in Australia, Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, is generally made as a white wine. And for a long time, uh, Dad was also of the opinion that Pinot Gris should only be white wine. I tasted some wines a bit like this, not made from Pinot Gris, but wines that were made from white grape varieties but made using red wine winemaking techniques. When I went to Italy in 2010, I was in Umbria with my cousin Sarah and her lovely husband Roberto and we went to a couple of wineries and we had this incredible wine. That, oh, hi, Robin, Deb, lovely to see you. Excellent, good. <laughs> I'm feeling reassured now. Um, I had this amazing wine that was uh, that was made from Trebbiano but the winemaker said this is made using red wine making techniques and the bottle was opened yesterday, but that's okay because it looks best when it's been open for three days. And I just passed my Master of Wine exams. I thought I knew a lot about wine. I thought I was a bit of an expert, and I'd never heard of anything like this before. So I was intrigued. We tasted the wine. It was really unusual. It was dark golden in colour. It had really intriguing, complex nose. It was very textural. It was a really confusing wine for me at that stage. Um, and we bought a bottle because I was staying with my cousins um, for another four days. We bought a bottle and we took it home. We opened it up and we had a glass and put the rest in a decanter and we drank it over four days. And it, she was right. It was better after being open for four days. It was quite incredible. So I came back to the winery and I hadn't been involved with winemaking for quite a long time. And I think I told you last week that we didn't ever plant Pinot Gris here on the McIntyre Vineyard, but Pinot Gris came to us through um, through the Garden Vineyard, uh, through the Osborne Vineyard, um, vineyards that we're leasing and that we're making wine from the fruit. And so we had this Pinot Gris and we didn't really have a preconceived idea about what we wanted to do with it. And so I came home and I stuffed around a bit and I finally got round to doing vintage with dad again a couple of years later dad and jeremy and um this fruit came in and it was sort of a weird color and i said that's really weird looking pinot noir where does that come from and dad and jeremy laughed at me and said no kate that's pinot gris and it's got this really kind of dark dusty dusky pink gray color to its skin um and it looks like a red grape variety and i said why do we make white wine out of this variety and and dad and jeremy said well that's just you know what you do with pinot gris so I did a bit of research and I did a bit of talking to people and I talked to some people down here like Barney Flanders at Garage East and he was playing around with Skinsy White Wines. Um, skinsy White Wines, that's a cool winemaker talk for white wine that's fermented on skins. So that's why this wine's called Pinot Gris on Skins. Some people find it to be a fairly um, unexciting name but it says what we do to the wine. It's Pinot Gris fermented on skins, therefore Pinot Gris on Skins. Um Talked to a few people and annoyed Dad basically until he two years later said, "Look, here's half a ton of fruit. Um, it's Pinot Gris. What do you want to do with it? How are we going to treat this uh, differently from normal?" And so I said, "Let's just let's just make it the same way as we make Pinot Noir." And so we did, and we made this little. We made one barrel of Pinot Gris on skins, and that was in 2015. And um, and I said to Dad, "Look, if it doesn't work out, I promise I'll pay you for the fruit. I'll give it to my friends. I'll throw it down the sink. Whatever. We'll, we'll I'll deal with it. But it could be a really lovely addition to the range." And he was a bit skeptical. Um, 
I think we were all a bit worried about what it was going to be. And um, so for the first couple of years, we just made a very small amount. And when we finally got around to showing it to people, um, first of all, we were really surprised at how delicious it was when we finished making it. It kind of showed some signs of being delicious along the way, but you always wait until it's ready to go before you make a final decision about it. We were surprised at how delicious it was. And we were really um, amazed at the reaction that we got for this wine from the rest of uh, from from the rest of the people that we showed it to, and so it was the beginning of a of a new era for Muradak, making um, almost a. Yes, people talk about natural wines and orange wines and all those kind of things, and we don't really we we don't really put ourselves in that bracket because we do like to use a little bit of sulphur in our wine making, never more than we need to, but. You know, small amounts. We don't like to, you know, we, we like to make sure that the wine is delicious and is protected from the elements and from becoming vinegar because that's what wine wants to be. It wants to be vinegar. And what we're doing is helping it to stop before it becomes vinegar and stay as something that's delicious, has some alcohol in it, but also hopefully smells and tastes yummy too. Um, and we've been making this wine ever since. And it's a little bit embarrassing how excited people got about this wine. Um, I think because it's such a beautiful colour and because it's a style of wine that not many people are making here and the people who are making the really kind of extreme orange wines are doing making wines that are less protected and uh, have more savoury characters and less fruit. And I think the thing that I really love about this wine is that, yes, it's very different from any other Pinot Gris that you might taste, but it has a beautiful fruit and floral expression to it. It's not it's not earthy and meaty and and uh, and and too confronting. It's still really delicious. So, what does it smell like? I hope that you're drinking while I'm talking. I'm talking a lot today. Ah, my pleasure. Pocket full of who are you? Pocket full of shell. Lovely to see you enjoying the wine with garlic and parmesan chips and a triple brie. Well, I'm glad. I think that's a fantastic food and wine match and I'm glad you enjoyed the, the, uh, the snack tasting note. I will try and do one of those every week for you. So on the nose for me, it's got this beautiful rose petal, slightly violet floral aromatic to it. There's some pink ginger. There's, um, there's almost some ginger flower in there. It's really, it's really lifted and perfumed. There's a little bit of rhubarb. It's quite intriguing. And on the palate, it's got lovely fruit. It's unusual and surprising because it's got that tannin grip that you expect from a red wine, even though it looks like a rosé. And that lovely, almost, um, it's a crunchy, rhubarb strawberry fruit character, which is a little bit sweet and a little bit savoury, a little bit herbal and lots of yummy things going on that for me makes it just the most delicious wine to sit and sip and keep uh, enjoying um, just as it is. My food and wine snack recommendations are just one of the things. If you, it also, Jeff, you were having Gruyere with the, uh, with the Pinot Gris last week as well, but I do think that Gruyere is a great match to all Pinot Gris and quite a lot of aged Chardonnay too. So Gruyere is a good cheese to have in the fridge. Um, the other things that this wine goes really well with, which take a little bit more preparation, um, I think it goes fabulously with sushi and sashimi, particularly uh, tuna and salmon, because the red the red fish goes really well with the flavours of this of this pink wine. Uh, it works really well with Chinese style uh, dumplings, pot stickers, soup dumplings, those kind of things. It can handle a little bit of chili. Works very nicely with that. Um, as I said on my tasting note, soft cheeses, Gruyere works well, bit of charcuterie, chips, potato chips, they work really well if you can't get anything else. Oh, yes, Jeff, I'd love to trade some Gruyere with you. That would be lovely. Thank you. Um, but on its own, it's rather delicious too. And if I had some of Angela's bread still, I'd be having a snack on that as well. Um, I think the, um, the the sun is the sun is still starting to come down. There's Jill in the background feeding, going to feed the bird. Hello, Jill. Hello. hello. <laughs> we'll let her have a drink after she's finished working. <laughs> um, uh, Susan, nice to see you here. Anyway, that's okay. Um, I thought I did send out the email link, but it might have got lost for some people. 
uh, it is yummy on its own and it's and it's a wine that it changes in the glass so you know if you've got a little bit of time this evening once we've once we've signed off you can just sit warm it up a little bit with your hands and see how it changes as it warms up um, swirl it around get some air into it enjoy those beautiful colors and you'll notice as well if you've got sunshine where you are it's not it's not quite as clear as some wines are and that's because it's a red wine so it's got some tannin in it and it's got a little bit of sediment in there so with time this wine will drop a little bit of sediment like a red wine and you might want to if you if you're cellaring it and putting it away you can um you can then decant it off the off the lees uh jackie wants to know the alcohol it's says 13 and a half on the bottle which i'll let you in on a secret that usually means it's about 14 percent <laughs> we have a leeway of about half a percent and when we do the measuring when we get the labels printed you just never quite know exactly where you are but with the pinot gris it's usually about 13 and a half to 14 percent and this one was a slightly riper um was a slightly riper year so 14 14 percent alcohol so a little bit like the pinot gris last week it's a little bit higher than say our chardonnays it's around the same um alcohol content as our pinot noirs um craig i do get a little bit of light truffle craig is asking if i get a little bit of light truffle on the nose truffle notes and i do and this is a wine that works very well if you've got a little truffle and some pasta if you make it like a, a carbonara or something like that and grate some truffle over the top it is just absolutely to die for um it's that little mushroomy, truffly, savoury kind of thing going on and it's what makes this wine sexy, I think, because it's not just about florals and fruits but there's a little undertow of savouriness which is which is very special. Um, Rob is suggesting a fondue, which I think you can never go past a fondue, always a good suggestion. I think that you're all right on the right sort of uh, wavelength with this wine. Um, it is probably the most uh, controversial wine that we make, but it's surprisingly not controversial in the fact that it seems to be enjoyed by most of the people who try it. Um, every now and again we get someone who kind of goes, oh, it's a bit odd, but, you know, that's just Muraduck Estate for you. We are a little bit odd. We, we, uh, we, we like to be a little individualistic, and I think this fits quite nicely into the rest of the um, – the individualness of uh, Muradak Estate. So everyone, it's been lovely having a drink with you again tonight. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, of course. Now you've probably seen my many, many uh, emails that I've been that I've been uh, sending. That we're doing a little um, we're doing a little offer for you guys at the moment. That if you do taste anything on these Thursday nights that you really love and you feel like you should have multiple bottles in your in your cellar then um, we're doing a little offer you any five bottles of one wine that you order we'll make it up to a half dozen with a little mystery uh a mystery wine that um will be of the from the estate level range but will be from our museum stock if you feel like ordering a dozen then order 11 bottles and we'll give you a mystery wine a lucky dip wine from our single vineyard range also from the museum stock and when we get to the end of this series, which we're up to week four today, so next week we're going to be tasting the Robinson Chardonnay and the week after we're tasting the Devil Bend Creek Pinot Noir, the following week we will taste our two mystery wines. So it gives you a little bit of time. If you feel like stocking up on a little bit of something or something else, then uh, then you can um, pop your order through the wine shop. And uh, if you're in Melbourne on the Mornington Peninsula, Jeff or I will bring it to your doorstep. If you're further afield, we'd still love you to order. I think Australia Post is actually... Um, they're putting more people on. They've been really slow for the last couple of weeks, which is one of the reasons that we started doing the hand deliveries where we could. But um, they've got better now. We're getting we're getting parcels coming through within two days again to us now. So I think that they've put some more people on and they're catching up with some of their backlog. So um, by all means, order five bottles or 11 bottles and we'll give you a little, uh, a little lucky dip line and we'll taste them together in three weeks' time. So there's something for you to look forward to. In the meantime, I'd like to say cheers. The sun is about to set. Uh, it's definitely time for to put your feet up, have a little relax with a little glass of Pinot Gris on skins. Uh, and uh, I will see you all again next week. Thank you very much. It's been lovely. Oh, hang on. Susan Hawthorne, that's a really good point. Volpino and Mount Martha are doing takeaway pizzas and they do an amazing pizza with mushrooms to legio and truffle oil. Give that a go. 
delicious. I will see you all again next week. Thank you very much. And please feel free to email me on kate at muradakastate.com.au if you've got any questions, any suggestions, birthday shout outs, whatever you like. It's just lovely spending this little bit of time with you on a Thursday night. Cheers, everyone. Craig, yes, I think we could get Chardonnay to you by next Thursday. Send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll get it sorted out. All right, cheers. Bye.